Well, thank you. Thank you all for attending this uh, meeting. It's my first time in this room. I can't imagine there are at least a dozen of colleagues trying to, to find this, this place. Uh, thank, you for, thank you for coming. And welcome to, to this uh, public uh, seminar on building the European Diplomatic Ac Academy, a work in progress. I would like only to hint a little bit about uh, what is the framework in which this uh, uh, proposal, political proposal, because uh, the antecedents were uh, older than this uh, last uh, uh, attempt, uh, is uh, a reflection uh, that uh, in, in foreign affairs in the European Parliament, sometimes in many, in many other places dealing with foreign affairs, we are jumping from one crisis to another, not having the time to reflect on the tools and maybe sometimes on the faces representing our, our foreign uh, policy. And, and these uh, reflections drove me to try to conduct inside uh, foreign uh, affect committee in the parliament reflections on the tools. Well, the basis is clear. We want to be a, a global actor. I think we have prepared some papers, but we also act in that direction. We have to examine if our tools are conducive to this target of being a real global actor. And at the same time, we have to reflect what happened 10 years after having the main tool of our foreign uh, policy, uh, that is our diplomacy and the external service of the, the European Union. And for that reason, I try to put in the agenda <clears throat> not only the, the fact or the, or the piece of the diplomatic academy, but the model of our diplomacy the model of our embassies uh, and, and the way in we can act in the world with these uh, tools, uh, the, the means, the funding, the personnel, the profiles of our embassies. Um, and the other part of this little piece is trying to help to this uh, uh, target of being a global actor is our cultural diplomacy, the face we offer to the world, because the member states, especially the big member states, they have a very powerful institutional, uh, cultural uh, institutions acting in the world, thinking the Cervantes, or Goethe, um, uh, others of that, of that time. Like what is the face of the European Union in third countries? We have to approach societies not appearing as an inarticulate patchwork of uh, national images. Uh, the other is uh, the necessity of having right information in Brussels concerning crisis outside the European Union, and that uh, drove us to explore what is the role of our national intelligence services in providing information um, in, a, in, a, in, a, in, in time and useful for the uh, acting uh, of the European Union, and other like our position in multilateral fora, and including in this very general expression our situation in the in the uh, Security Council of the, of the uh, United Nations. And uh, one of the pieces of this idea is our diplomacy. In one of the pieces of this reflection on the diplomacy is how to form and select uh, our diplomats. And this is the origin of a pilot project of this uh, group, of this political group, and later of the parliament, uh, supporting and funding the idea, OK, let's explore uh, this idea of creating a um, European Diplomatic Academy. The pilot project was granted uh, 1 million euro round in the first year. And we are having another million euro uh, that has to be managed by uh, the external service to study the feasibility and to start uh, practicing this uh, idea. And this is uh, the origin, this is the reason in which we have uh, here our, our colleagues. Uh, Federica Mogherini, you all know Federica Mogherini, uh, Italian Minister of Foreign Affairs, uh, High Representative and Vice President, and now uh, Rector of the uh, College of Europe. Uh, Fernando Gentilini, who is the uh, representative of all these, the people uh, appointed by the external service to take care of this uh, project, and uh, Ambassador James Moran with us, and Sabine Lange, in remote, I hope everything is is, is okay with uh, some uh, connection. Just to inform the public of what is the current uh, situation of the project, what are the perspectives, what are maybe the difficulties? Could we to have a, the first could could say insight of the machinery 
of the project uh, in this uh, current situation. But first, before uh, giving the word to our guest, I would like to pass the floor to Pedro Marquez, who is the vice president of the Social Democrat Group, uh, taking care of uh, foreign affairs issues on behalf of our Pedro, please. Gracias, Nacho. Um, thank you so much and a warm welcome to all of you, particularly, of course, to our invitees, to the panelists. It's great having you. It's always great to have you, Federica. But, I mean, uh, it's important to have, of course, the EAS discussing with us, but also senior uh, uh, researchers uh, on the matter. It's great for the S&D that you all accepted our, our invitation and for so many of you to also be here to discuss the future in a sense of this initiative, but of most globally over even of our EU diplomacy. I mean, this initiative, I have to com commend Nacho for the initiative. This is really his baby. I mean, it's, it's been Nacho's baby for a while. He's been advocating for this, and it's really about transforming a vision for EU foreign affairs policy, for EU diplomacy into concrete action. And that's what Nacho did so well in this, through this project, through this pilot project, and now that we will try to develop as much as possible in the, in the near future. Um, we as SND, of course, uh, and uh, it's been a while now that we have been in fully involved in this in this debate about our foreign policy, our the, the evolution of our foreign policy. Of course, Federica was absolutely critical for that in her time. Um, Josep Borrell is doing such a great job as well. Finally, with, with their inspiration, with their work, we managed to come to the strategic compass, which was a very important achievement per se. But then, as you know, or at the same time we were adopting the strategic compass, we were, I mean, a, a war was dropping upon us, literally, uh, upon Europe. So, I mean, it made it even more important, um, all the work that we did towards the adoption of the, the strategic compass, but at the same time it made it even more important to uh, be ambitious, be more ambitious towards this foreign um, security and defence policy of the EU. At least it made it certainly more visible to everybody why so many were trying for so many years to, uh, uh, to reinforce this pillar of the, of the EU. Um, this, this, this tool, the Diplomatic Academy, it's certainly um, a step into the direction of what we have been pursuing for a decade now with the, with the creation of the External Action Services, which is indeed to strengthen, strengthen our voice in the world, strengthen our capacity to be present in the world and to pursue a foreign policy throughout the world. Um, we as a group and we as a political family, I might say, we have been working on this. It's not, it was not even only up, up, uh, up to the moment in which the strategic compass was adopted. Actually, by that moment, we group started a process that is still undergoing to approve our vision for European strategic autonomy. Our foundation, FEPS, is doing a parallel work of the same nature. We are doing this together, of course. So the political family is engaging, is not shying away from this debate on our foreign policy and even on our, as I say, foreign security and defence policy as a whole. And in the end, on how we, Europe, want to be more influential in the world. We are witnessing, we are living a world in which uh, global powers are clashing um, and, 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 and our, um, our vision that still a world all of multilateralism, a world of values, we still believe that's the world we want to pursue, but at the same time we perceive that we need to be more relevant in the international arena if we still want to pledge and uh, deliver on these values. And so for a political family that normally um, is, is values-based, is, 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 is pursuing this, this, uh, this mission and this direction, could be awkward to be at the same time thinking about Europe's strategic autonomy, but no, we are not trying to close out on, uh, upon ourselves. We are not trying to create any wall or any defensive barrier. No, we want to make ourselves more meaningful, more useful in the world, more relevant, so that we can pursue still the values of multilateralism and um, of uh, human rights and all the ones that are encompassing to the, to the European vision to the world. And for that, we do need stronger uh, diplomatic services. We need to create this perception of integration of our diplomatic services, 
do what the, the, action, the, the European External Action Service have been doing for a decade, do more of the same and do uh, better if possible, and certainly create more of a European vision towards foreign policy, which means also stop the cacophony when it exists, uh, have really one voice in the world, you will see when we present this vision that we will be pledging for a European seat in the international organizations, the critical ones. We will be putting this idea that we do need one voice and not certainly two voices at the same time, almost even competing on who says what uh, on, 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 on the international arena. So. Um, more will come, of course, on what we think about the role of the I representative and its prominence in the foreign policy of this union. But, uh, as I say, one vision, Europe stronger in the world, more coordination in different areas, but tools to get there. And this is certainly one of them, and Nacho was completely right from the beginning on uh, challenging us to, to create this spirit and to create this concrete academy um, for European diplomacy. So, eager to have the say of our invitees. Once again, thanks so much, and then the debate with all of you that accepted the invitation. There will be, of course, a space for you to put your questions, to put your comments to the table. We'll be doing the best to um, to make them also useful for our own debate here within the Parliament. So, without further ado from my side, Nacho, back to you to moderate the panel, and uh, I'll be here as as long as possible to get all the input uh, for the group, but Nacho, as I say, is really our pillar, so he will be the one handling all the rest of the of the session. Thank you so much, Nacho. Okay, thank you, thank you, Pedro. Um, uh, Federica is not able to stay with us more than 30 minutes. Then, <clears throat> if you allow me, the others. Yes, I'm passing the floor to Federica to uh, to to say what, what, what is happening in this pilot project that she is uh, conducting the rest in Bruges. Thank you very much. Gracias, uh, uh, Nacho. Pedro, uh, it's uh, great to be back, also feeling a little bit in family. Uh, but uh, um, it's, uh, uh, I would like to thank, uh, first of all, uh, not only uh, Pedro and the entire group, uh, but in particular uh, Nacho and his team, because indeed uh, uh, I think that this initiative of uh, uh, creating a pilot project for a diplomatic academy that I hope will then be established as a full-fledged academy in the future uh, is uh, indeed one uh, key element of the build-up of the European diplomacy. Um, I will... Uh, so I would start with a big thank you. Uh, my only regret is that uh, we didn't do it, I didn't do it when I was high representative, I wonder why, uh, because it is really something that is uh, uh, filling a gap. Uh, it's, uh, it's merging uh, one important element of how the machinery of the European diplomacy is working, potentially. Now it's only a pilot project, but over time I think it has really a huge potential for introducing change and structural change in the European diplomatic system which is in itself a work in progress. Uh, ten years, uh, a little bit more, is really young diplomatic service. So I think that all inputs on how to drive it towards improving even further uh, are interesting and, and, and important. Um, but the pilot project in itself now is work in progress. So I guess that my, uh, my role here is to brief you, is to share with you how it's going, because uh, the uh, College of Europe, uh, um, I have the honour to be rector of, uh, has uh, won uh, the um, call for tenders uh, to run this pilot project uh, in uh, June. And so as of the end of August, uh, we are running this pilot project. Uh, first, we've had two weeks uh, of preliminary uh, programme, uh, team building and visits to the borders uh, of the European Union with Ukraine and uh, Belarus, and then uh, uh, starting uh, the programme itself uh, in Bruges, uh, here in Belgium, uh, since September. Uh, and we are currently running it. Um, so, just to give you a little bit of uh, the framework, the figures, the state of play, uh, you might not all be up to speed with that, so I'll just uh, try to put us on the same page. The pilot project uh, uh, has now 40 participants, um, junior diplomats. I don't call them young diplomats because age might, might, might differ, but all of them have entered their respective services not longer than five years ago. Most of them actually one or two years ago only, uh, from member states, from candidate countries, uh, and from uh, some European institutions. 
Um, it's a residential program, so they live together in a residence, very much similar to the one in which our students in the College of Europe, uh, the, the same kind of, uh, uh, of experience of living together that we have at the College of Europe in Bruges and in Nazalin. Um, they have uh, uh, 30 hours of classes every week, uh, plus a life together. They eat together, they organize extra curricular activities together, sometimes also with students and student societies, conferences. But I would say that the most, maybe one of the most important things is that they also host um, visiting groups of junior diplomats or delegations that, if they happen to be in Brussels, extend their stay and visit them in Bruges. So they also exercise the diplomatic skills in welcoming them, having official lunches or dinners or conferences, briefing them on what they're doing. And they come to Brussels to visit institutions or to have meetings or to participate to special events that are the nature of the European diplomatic uh, activity, um, I would say on average once a week. Uh, Bruges is one hour away by train, so this is uh, very easy to arrange. What are they studying? What are they doing? Uh, studying is not the appropriate word because they're not only studying, they're also practicing. They're mainly practicing and living the European diplomatic experience. 80% of the lecturers of the program uh, that has a curriculum, a syllabus that covers uh, um, different study areas, from the fundamentals of the legal framework of the interinstitutional relations and the international, um, the foreign policy competencies of the institutions to the geographical policies, uh, bilateral, multilateral, different areas of work, the defense and security elements, everything basically, protocol, uh, even logistics and you know the buildings and the contracts, every administration, everything that a diplomat in the European um, service uh, needs to be aware of in order to be able to act efficiently from day one, they are mainly practicing. So 80% of the lecturers that are providing them classes and uh, uh, are practitioners, uh, former practitioners or officials, uh, including um, at the very top level, uh, heads of delegation, current or former. Um, just to tell you, I think the, the very first days when they were in Bruges, they started with uh, lectures from Pierre Vimont, uh, former Secretary General of the External Action Service, David O'Sullivan. This is the kind of level they are exposed to. Uh, and uh, in these first three months, actually, they have been meeting with foreign ministers, uh, not just meeting, but spending time, foreign ministers, commissioners, vice presidents, Borrell came to inaugurate the academy and spent some time with them. Um, we're going to have the visit of the president of the commission on Sunday. And they attended the ES, uh, the ambassador's conference of the ES uh, uh, for a couple of sessions. So the point is to expose them to the reality of the life of the external action service at all levels. Um, why is that so? What is the purpose of this, uh, um, of this uh, at least from, from how we have, uh, we have structured it. Um, it is actually to try to contribute or to contribute to um, elevating the quality and the effectiveness of national diplomats that enter the European service. Uh, I have seen uh, the national diplomacy as a minister and I've seen the European diplomacy as a high representative. And I have seen in particular uh, one of the aspects that are more complicated to manage. Uh, I think the European diplomacy is excellent. I think we have a duo in our hands, but still it's a young service and with a lot of also institutional uh, things to be uh, worked on still. And one of these elements is obviously the fact that in the external action service, you have a mix of European officials and national diplomats. And while the European officials that enter the external action service have a very deep knowledge normally, in general, then there are always exceptions of how the European machinery works, how the Brussels mechanisms work. What is the competence of the European Parliament, Coreper, PSC, the Commission, the different DGs, the working groups? This is something that European officials, in principle, know, but not necessarily national diplomats. And so I have experienced many times a situation where you have excellent national diplomats, like actually I think are our participants that have been trained by the national diplomatic academies and the national diplomatic services to be high-level diplomats, to, to know how to deal with the geopolitical situation of today, to bilateral, bilateral relations, diplomacy as such. But they don't necessarily have the knowledge and the understanding of the European instruments, of the European mechanisms of decision-making or implementation. 
And this, in my experience, and I think in our general assessment, is something that creates a difficulty sometimes for national diplomats that enter the European uh, External Action Service to be able from day one to operate in a very complex environment because the European uh, foreign policy machinery is a complex one and a complex one that has different instruments and tools, including tools that are not proper of the diplomacy, including, you know, it can be trade, investments, uh, uh, instruments that are in the hands of the Commission. There is the need to have diplomats that are able to understand, read and interact with the geopolitical situation of today that is more and more complex, but also that have a deep understanding and knowledge about how the European <coughs> Union institutions work, from you know, uh, how to uh, deploy a mission or an operation to the budget uh, procedures and things like that, or the preparations of the councils, or the role of the parliament again. So this is what we are doing in these months. We are adding a layer of knowledge and understanding um, on diplomats that already are trained on diplomatic skills, on how the European Union external action works, and which are the tools and instruments that they might use if they enter or if they interact with the European um, external action. Uh, there is one additional element uh, that I think is essential, uh, as we are seeing this happening now, is the creation of the network. The fact that these 40 uh, junior diplomats, uh, coming from very different backgrounds, uh, are living together, studying together, experiencing and practicing things together, um, is creating an esprit du corps uh, that makes them already now, after a few months, move from uh, the feeling of representing a country to the feeling of still having a national background, as we all have, but being able to act European. And I think that this is really what makes, can make the difference, to build and this is why I hope that this prog project will uh, find uh, continuity over time, to build over time a network of hundreds, potentially, of junior diplomats with different nationalities and different backgrounds that will have gone through the same training and will have a network of contacts that will allow them to, uh, to act European, even keeping the national background, also because national diplomats, at the end of the day, go back to their capitals. And this is another story on which the Academy is not, uh, is not uh, uh, involved. So um, in, in short, because time has already uh, been, uh, I mean, I've already used uh, too much uh, of your time. Uh, for the moment, uh, uh, I have to say the level of enthusiasm of the participants and of the lecturers uh, is extremely high. Uh, as I said, uh, uh, they have uh, in average 30 hours uh, a week of classes. And normally uh, they have something like five or six uh, uh, lectures uh, uh, every week, different, so that we expose them to different views, uh, different nationalities, different genders, different institutions, or different uh, backgrounds, also academics. For the moment, the level of enthusiasm is very high, um, which surprises me because I was expecting a plateau and then a little bit of a decline, while actually still it's very high. I think that uh, uh, the main points uh, to be then taken from here, and on which maybe, uh, again, the External Action Service, but also the group and the parliament could, uh, could work, if I can just give a sense of w which challenges I see coming up, and, and I'll conclude on that, is uh, uh, what about them afterwards? We train them, and then what do they do? <laughs> do they go back to their national system? Do they go in permanent representations? Do they enter the external action service? Uh, what is their future? What is their destiny? Um, so that the investment that we make in training them is properly used. Um, and the second one is the continuity of the project, uh, because I think that, uh, uh, well, I'm extremely enthusiastic myself, I have to say, uh, but I think that uh, uh, it will be even of more value uh, if and to extend to the extent um, in which it will manage to create a big network over time uh, so that year after year uh, again it will not be 40 but it will be potentially 100 200 500 thousands of junior diplomats that have been going through the same training belonging to the same alumni network and be able to act as uh, as as, uh, as a group of european diplomats wherever they are posted uh, in Brussels, in delegations, in perm reps, uh, in national uh, embassies everywhere in the world, but having this European package on their shoulders that will make them more sensitive 
uh, to, uh, to expressing and, and leading on European positions, contributing to shaping the European positions. At the end of the day, European foreign policy is shaped by member states largely. So this is also something that is good as an investment to f invest in national diplomats that will be able to contribute to shaping European foreign policies from a national perspective. That is also, I think, a very good thing to, to have. But to create a sort of critical mass that over years will contribute to make the external action service and the external action of the European Union uh, more, uh, more solid. I'm sorry I've been uh, uh, long. I could speak for, I think, a couple of hours more. Uh, and I'm uh, even more uh, sorry that I will have to leave uh, uh, indeed in 15, 20 minutes. Uh, this is something I hate speaking and then leaving before. But unfortunately, I have to be in uh, the University of Leuven uh, this afternoon. Uh, but uh, uh, if there is anything that you want me to come back on before I leave, happy to interact. Thank you. Thank you, Federica. Yes, of course, we are offering uh, the audience the possibility to address you in these 15 minutes, not more. And um, please be taking into account this uh, strength of time. Uh, be brief, please, madam. Thank you very much for the invitation. It's a very interesting conference. And my name is Stella Veliki. I study physics informatics. I am a member of the European Physical Society. And I have two questions for Ms. Um, you, for you. Um, there are EU representatives in the most countries of the world, and they have the knowledge of EU institutions. My question is, what will do more the people of EU diplomacy, diplomatic academy in this case? Uh, because I think there are the same people are doing the same things, and uh, that is not so good. And the second, the last question is: um, the political and diplomatic position of EU uh, is uh, not so important in on the international level. Huh? Uh, the people of EU Diplomatic Academy can do it better, and how? We are collecting two, two or three questions uh, because uh, the so question the you, you, you made, it's, for, it's, it's for a seminar. Yes, of course, madam. Other questions? Other questions? Yes, please. So maybe very quick. Um, I was curious about whether you envision the possibility. So today we only have national diplomats that get to um, get formed at the College of Europe in this new program. Do you envision in the future to either like form diplomats for the European institutions straight away, or maybe for the new um, position of um, AD5 in external relations, that would be also a possibility to form these people to take the EPSO exam in, and become just directly European diplomats? Thank you very much. No, no, Thank no. you. Yes. yes. Go ahead. Uh, yes, I'll be very brief because I'm also interested in hearing what uh, other colleagues have to say. Um, on, on this last question, uh, we have already now uh, diplomats uh, from member states, diplomats from uh, candidate countries, as I mentioned. We also have a few uh, of uh, those participants that are officials, but not diplomats, technically, because, for instance, there are some ministries. I mean, in some member states, there are some ministries where the EU competencies are not necessarily linked to the foreign ministry. So um, the selection procedure has not been in our hands, has been in the external action service hands. So Fernando might be more precise on uh, plans for future selections. We only receive the list of participants and set up the programme and run the programme, which is not a minor thing. Um, but uh, there are already now um, three participants that are coming from the institutions. We have two participants from the External Action Service and one from the Council. Uh, and uh, uh, I think this is uh, um, a very good experience, uh, even if uh, the training is slightly uh, is slightly different for each of the three different groups, EU member states diplomats, non-EU member states diplomats, and uh, EU officials, because obviously the training they have already had is different and their perspectives, professional perspectives might be different. But in my experience uh, in this first, first months uh, of uh, pilot project is that uh, yes, there is a large potential, huge potential for um, uh, having a training of, uh, um, of European diplomats as such also, uh, because indeed uh, the level of uh, knowledge or even the attitude development or the skills development uh, is something that is indeed needed. 
and the European External Action Service doesn't have a European Diplomatic Academy in, as such, internally. It has some programs, but not so. So, especially on the level of skills and attitude development, I think that definitely this could be a direction to explore. And on your questions, Madam, we would need uh, probably a couple of days to answer. Uh, personally, I think that the European Union position is very relevant in the world. And I think that if it was not, uh, um, I mean, sometimes we don't realize how it is relevant, how much it is relevant, because we give it for granted. But just imagine taking the entire European Union external action away from the world for 24 hours, and probably most of the places in the world will collapse before the 24 hours. If you put together, uh, you know, foreign, traditional foreign policy, um, humanitarian development, trade, uh, digital inter infrastructure, whatever. Uh, obviously, the idea is to have and to form and to train young diplomats that can contribute even better to the shaping of the European foreign policy. You can always improve. But I have to admit, what I have seen is a very high quality of the European diplomacy already now. It can be improved, especially in forming, I think, this connection and this esprit du corps so that people feel belonging to the same uh, institution and to the same family and to have to share the same purpose. That, I think, yes, can be definitely improved. Thank you, Federica. Any other question to Federica? Just the last one. Hi, good afternoon. Uh, so I think this project is very, very uh, interesting. But my question is, um, processes of hiring diplomats in EU member states differ, and also their preparation may differ. So my question is, uh, did this turn out to be an issue when they arrived there? And how can this be changed at the national level to have a more uniform preparation for diplomats entering the foreign service? Thank you. This is, I think, a question for Nacho, because, <laughs> the, yes, they have different uh, trainings. Uh, some, mm, some foreign ministries have diplomatic academies, some others don't, have different programs. And indeed, we have, uh, uh, we have done a sort of entry test uh, at the very beginning to measure the starting point. And indeed, the level of knowledge and the level of, uh, uh, of uh, um, preparation was very different on different topics. Uh, which reflects individual uh, paths, but also structural uh, differences. Uh, obviously, the ideal long-term uh, dream could be that of having uh, a European concours uh, for European diplomats. Uh, but this, I think, would be I mean, very far in, in times where you have a European diplomatic academy that forms European diplomats that serve the European diplomacy. But I also see pros and cons in this even long-term vision or dream. Um, it, it, is, uh, not, it has not been so much of an issue uh, because we have uh, uh, taken things from the fundamentals. So we've started from the basics of the fundamentals of how the European External Action Service works, the legal framework, the competencies, the interinstitutional dynamics. So we've started from zero so that there was nothing uh, that, uh, I mean, Probably at the beginning, some were not following some things and some others were listening to things they knew already. But we have tried to do the first four weeks of leveling of knowledge on the basis of what we're talking about. And only in the second month, in the second study area modules, we have entered into more uh, specific um, um, formats. And, and, and topics. So we have spent the first two weeks in, in Poland, in our campus in Poland, to do the team building uh, and the on-the-ground visits. I think visiting the Ukrainian and the Belarusian border was an experience, at least for me, was really a striking experience to realize why it is important to have a European diplomatic service on the ground. And then we spent the first month in Bruges to uh, bring everybody at the same level of understanding and knowledge about the basics, the fundamentals, so that then they could really interact and work together. Hope this answers your question. Thank you, Federica. Uh, well, we have a person that has a yes. deep knowledge of these uh, different jumps between national and international diplomacy. The Ambassador Fernando Gentilini, who is now uh, the principal advisor to, to, to take care of this uh, project. She's an Italian diplomat. She has been working, of course, for the Italian diplomacy, but also in NATO and uh, external service. That means he knows very well this different position with which a national diplomat could work uh, in the international uh, arena. Then, uh, Fernando, it's your time to explain this. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Um, uh, maybe, sorry for that, but just one word. 
of thank because I think we, we are in the US very, very grateful, uh, both uh, Nacho to you for your um, leadership and for pushing this idea forward. Uh, Joseph Borel was very, very happy to, to, let's say, jump on it and, and implement it as well as uh, our Secretary General, Stefano Sannino. And thank you, Federica. I'm, I'm, I'm now almost quoting Borel when he was in the opening um, of the academic year in, in, in Bruges a few weeks ago. Uh, we are very grateful uh, for, for the work that you are doing and the college is, uh, is doing. Uh, what is going on in Bruges, I think, is quite extraordinary. And um, I, I'm not going to go into, and maybe James would say something about the, the historical background of, of what we are doing. But uh, I, I think if you look at the, 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 the history of the EU, the history of EU diplomacy forming national diplomats together with officials, opening this up also to uh, diplomats from uh, uh, candidate countries is, is quite unique. And the, the, the formation, uh, the syllabus, uh, the curriculum, what they do every day is quite unique. Um, yes, it's, uh, it's very much a, an issue of identities also, uh, because uh, as, as it was said, I'm a, a national diplomat. Um, I've been working uh, a lot for the EU, I've been working also with NATO, so I'm Italian, I'm European, I like uh, transatlantic relations. So here it's an issue of putting together all these identities, which is not uh, something that you take for granted. And I think in, 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 in short, what we are doing and we wanted to do and why the IS is really um, um, working hard uh, on, on this project. We wanted to form national diplomats in order to perform better on EU matters wherever they are and wherever they will be. And that's why we started with, uh, with, uh, with Junior. Um, we wanted, you know, my experience, I came to Brussels 25 years ago, I was lost for almost a year uh, because Brussels is beautiful. Uh, the beauty of Brussels, I think, is the sophistication, the complexity. You need to learn that. The experience as a, a, a manager in the AIS has been that when you have young colleagues coming from capitals, they are also lost for a while. So we really wanted to make sure that in the future they come better prepared on EU matter. And this is what's going on in Bruges, eh? trying to, to, to give them uh, the best uh, of formation on EU matter so that they can perform well if they join the IS, if they join a new delegation abroad, if they go back to capital and serve to an EU department of their Ministry of Foreign Affairs, if they come back to Brussels to work in their permanent representations, wherever they are, they can be useful. So this, I think, is the, the rationale uh, behind uh, this uh, project. A and I agree uh, with, uh, with what Nacho said, with what Federica said, we can be even more ambitious than that. But the important thing, in my view, is to start somewhere. So I will not really... Um, um, uh, I think we, we really need to find the right entry point to start forming diplomats. And this uh, exercise that is going on now, I think it can be the right entry point. We can be even more ambitious in the future along the lines which have been said already. But I think it has been very, very important to start. I'm not going to repeat, uh, Federica said it, everything, uh, but three points, very short. In my view, this is what so far is uh, being um, quite a, a success story uh, in terms of this first pilot project. And by the way, our objective is not to do a pilot project and then a second pilot with some adjustment. Our objective is to create a full-fledged diplomatic academy, which means something uh, solid and, and sustainable. Uh, which can work long time, because obviously uh, this is a very uh, long time uh, exercise. So three things which in my view has been quite, quite important um, up to now. The, the concept of having something residential. 
because, again, I'm a diplomat in Italian system. If I need something in Rome, if I have an issue in Rome, my, my reaction, my first instinct is to go back 30 years and look for colleagues who have been trained together with me in the Italian Diplomatic Institute. That's the model we wanted to, to follow here, to put 40 people this year uh, living together, working together, studying together, because this creates a, a bond. And diplomacy is many things, but it's also bond. It's also esprit de corps. It's also networking. So I think the concept of having the person following this in a residential format, I think, was, was, was the, 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 the good instinct. And this will stay. Uh, the second thing, I think, which is proved to be quite successful is uh, the, the repartition of Federica was mentioning 80% training by practitioners, 20% by academic. Uh, young diplomats are already formed. They went through university, some have master, PhD. What they need is the practical things. And actually, if I see an area where we can do more in the future will be to increase this training component of the academy, which is already quite a lot. But the more we can uh, uh, work more hand in hand with the institution, with the European External Action Service on, on training in the future, I think is, is, is good. And the third thing, which I think um, makes the difference, because nothing similar to this is going on in Europe, but also because of this proximity to Brussels, which makes possible for the participants to come here every week, basically and to engage and interact with the external action service, but also with the other institution on, on, uh, on, on, on a regular basis. I think these three things, residential, uh, practitioner training, and proximity to Brussels, in my view, is, uh, is, uh, is, uh, is something really important that we need to, to base for the future edition of, uh, of, uh, of this project. I think I'll, I'll, I'll stop here. But of course, I'm happy also to uh, thank take questions. Thank, thank you, Frederick. I have to yeah. have to I'm really sorry. Yes. Uh, let's go to Sabina Lange. Are you? The, yeah, uh, Sabina is connected. Uh, Sabina Lange is a senior lecturer at the European Institute for Public Administration and senior fellow of Maastricht University, associate professor for international relations in the U University of Ljubljana, and has trained member state officials in the in the programs of the. Um, rotating Council presidencies, he worked for the External Action Service, for, the, for every institution in Brussels, including the Committee of Regions. This is sometimes uh, an institution, our neighbours, that are not uh, frequently quoted uh, in, this, uh, in this house. Uh, Sabina, you have the floor for your approach to this uh, project, and thank you for, for being with us. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Nacho, for the I don't know if it's uh, the, the volume. Uh, just a, mo a moment, Sabine, Sabina. I don't know if it's the volume in the in the in the room or is your. Um, could you try again, please? Perhaps this is more audible. A little. Uh, yeah, we are we are checking. Just give give us a minute. What is the? It's not. Uh, Sabi offered the, 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 the uh, this moment to Ambassador Moran, and we we tried to, to fix the issue to have you in, in ten minutes. Sorry for that. We are checking with the personnel of, of the room. Thank you, uh, Ambassador Moran. Again, a, a, a junior diplomat, <laughs> talking about junior diplomat, very senior diplomat, having a lot of responsibility in many, many fields, uh, British, but working for the uh, European Union in many uh, countries, uh, Egypt, Jordan, uh, uh, Yemen, uh, Libya, China division, Asia the director, negotiating with China, Indonesia, Malaysia, Philippines, Singapore. Well, this is the kind of examples that we would like to have after this uh, period of training in the, in the European uh, diplomat. Please, uh, Ambassador James, please, you have the floor. 
Thank you very much, uh, Nacho, and um, thank you um, also for all of the energy that you're putting into this. Uh, uh, I'm sorry, okay. I don't hear anything, so I don't know if I'm supposed to speak or not. Yeah. Ah, yeah. she's on. The speak yes, the, sp the speaker of uh, Jamie, this is okay. Uh, I don't know, uh, could you check, Mel, because Sabina is not able to hear us. Uh, can you hear me now, Sabina? No, apparently not. Uh, uh, Sabina, I, I don't know, uh, call uh, Mel, call Sabina. We are fixing the issue. We're coming back to her in 10 minutes, OK? OK. Thank you, Nacho. And, um, yeah. I don't know if you uh, can hear me, but it seems that no one online hears anything from the room. Yes, we can hear you now loud and clear. But you, apparently, you are not able to hear us. Uh, okay, uh, please call Sabina and let's continue with Ambassador. Sorry, Ambassador. No, no, not at all. These things happen. We're all used to them. Yeah, we are all slaves to technology. Um, I think a lot of a lot has already been said uh, by Federica Mogherini and uh, Fernando about the about the project itself. And uh, for me, anyway, uh, having spent um, 35 years and more uh, in the European service, it, it's really good news because it's an idea whose time has come. Uh, I remember a long time back in the early 2000s uh, when I was doing something which uh, I see Marianne Connix is here as well. She also did later, which is the I was the president of the uh, Bureau of Heads of Delegation at that time. <clears throat> and back then, this is 20 odd years ago, uh, people, a number of people were already beginning to talk about the need for something like uh, this diplomatic academy to be pursued. Finally, it's happening. Of course, one of the reasons why it's taken so long is the skepticism amongst the member states. We all know that. And um, I think many uh, of them, especially the larger ones, uh, saw then, and, and some even today, see uh, diplomacy as primarily a traditional national preserve. I remember in the old days uh, when Javier Solana used to be traveling everywhere, I was the ambassador for the EU in Jordan back then, uh, and it was in the bad old days of the Troika, and it was the time of the Second Intifada in Palestine back then, and I was under strict instructions from the uh, Commissioner of External Relations here, in those days Chris Patton, now the Chancellor of Oxford, uh, to make sure that I didn't miss a thing, that I got involved in everything when Mr. Solana was in town. And in fact, Javier Solana was very, very keen that I would do that. That was his way. Uh, and is his way today. He hasn't changed. However, uh, the uh, member state in charge of the presidency, which I will not name, it certainly wasn't my country, but it was a big and important country, uh, did not like the idea uh, that uh, somebody from the institutions would be involved with meetings with King Abdullah and so on. This is not the business, said he, uh, of, um, of mere Eurocrats. This is not your business. This is the politics of peace. Uh, and so I was told I can't go. Uh, the matter was eventually resolved uh, between the principals here in Brussels, and I ended up making my reports. I got into the different meetings. I've since, uh, this gentleman has gone on to become uh, an extremely important uh, man, uh, and it is a man, not a woman, uh, in uh, a member state service, which I will not uh, name. Uh, and I saw him recently. He said, you know, um, remember those days back in Jordan? Um, you were right to insist. <laughs> Um, which is interesting because uh, he was very much schooled in the national tradition. Now, since then, of course, Lisbon has changed uh, substantially uh, everything. And I have been an ambassador for the EU both before and after it, and uh, uh, major changes have come in. But some of those old attitudes still linger in uh, some member state capitals. Um, that said, I think everybody today, including the gentleman I was mentioning, and know that um, if you're going to find ways forward on the big issues of the day, whether it's climate, whether it's crisis management, conflict resolution, um, this goes well beyond the definition and pursuit of purely national interests. And of course, in the uh, EU, uh, there is the need to understand the European interest and indeed the European identity. I don't need to labor that, I think, in this company, uh, but it is something which is uh, worth keeping in mind. And here, uh, the Diplomatic Academy certainly has an important role to play. Uh, the training of member state diplomats in particular, of course, but not only, uh, uh, is the, must be the focus. 
I must say there are, uh, and even in some of the cases where the member states have sent uh, their best and their brightest to become EU ambassadors, uh, people have struggled, especially in the earlier part of their three or four year term, because they simply haven't been schooled in the ways and means of the European institutions, and they don't know the people, at least as important. Uh, as we've heard uh, before from uh, previous speakers. And that's not surprising because uh, good foreign services know that if your ambassador is going to be effective, uh, he or she should have the knowledge of the local language. Um, and that's, of course, why you have such a strong focus on language training in many national services. Um, and likewise, when it comes to Europe, uh, the ambassador and his staff needs to know how to speak, if I can put it this way, speak European which is a language all of its own. We're using the English language today, we can use the French or the Spanish language tomorrow, whatever. But there is a way of speaking, uh, which I think we all know within these institutions, which you only learn by doing, uh, or by training, or both. Uh, now, the EDA does have, I think, um, a major role in helping those from outside these institutions to learn that language. And I hope that the, uh, there will be a mandatory uh, part of pre-posting in future, uh, at the academy for people coming uh, from outside but also for people coming from inside because it's a two-way process uh, uh, there are a number of aspects of national diplomacy which are useful for people from the institutions to be exposed to and uh, on the curricula of course uh, that's long and, and a complicated issue but i think um, it's important to try to uh, involve uh, courses that cover things like science diplomacy something which i think has been pursued in a way like nobody else here in uh, Europe, um, so that um, uh, the best can be made of the different uh, tools in the toolbox, as it were, of the European institutions. I know myself uh, how important that can be when I was in Egypt after the, um, uh, when the empire struck back and Mr. Sisi took power in 2013. We in Europe and the Americans as well were accused of being supporters of the Muslim Brotherhood. Nobody would talk to us. The only way you could get through was to use things like the Horizon Science programs, soft power things, which kept some sort of engagement going. It's so important. It's very underestimated. And I hope that the Diplomatic Academy can help a little bit there, especially with member state uh, diplomats, to see uh, these connections so that they can be effective wherever they're going to be. And uh, really, the last point I want to make, as mentioned before, is Frida Kaur. Um, uh, Federico Mogherini uh, mentioned that, and Fernando as well. That's so important. You often hear, and you, uh, Fernando himself did it just now in his intervention. Member state, national diplomats, very often when they have a problem or they want to have some help, whatever, uh, they often go back to the class that they graduated in from their own national services years ago. That doesn't exist at the moment in the European context. Perhaps the EDA will be able to do it. And I think it's very important there, too, to make sure that a, an alumni organization is set up. Uh, don't leave it uh, to go by the board, which is very often the case. People don't uh, value historical memory very highly in these institutions, but I hope that it will be uh, part of the um, part of the operation. And the very last point, I also hope that the EDA will have its own personality and its independence and that it will not be subsumed in university politics, whether it's at Bruges or wherever else it's going to be. I sit on a few university boards myself and I know the complications that can arise. And that will not be easy. Uh, but uh, it should have its own space and its own independence to make it as effective as it can be. Well, thank you so much for your attention and good luck to everybody associated with this project. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Ambassador Monac. Uh, Sabina, let's try again. If you are ready, please, you have, you have the floor. Thank you very much. I hate to say, but can you hear me now? Perfect. Loud and clear. Okay, thank Go you. <laughs> uh, so let, let me repeat my thanks for being invited. Thank you, Nacho, and thank you to the S&D group. Um, and also, of course, for making it possible to attend from uh, pre-presidency Stockholm. Um, it is really my pleasure to contribute to the discussion and indeed to the next steps in building capacity for European diplomacy and as such to the more visible, effective, and coherent European foreign policy. Uh, I'm a member of the team preparing the feasibility study uh, for set setting up the future EDAM. Um, I also should say that I had the immense privilege for many years now to run 
design, organized conduct, uh, several training programs uh, inside the Film Action Service, including their uh, so called onboarding uh, essential diplomacy program. Uh, now, the report has not yet been finalized, but uh, research has been conducted, and I can share some general observations in the coming minutes. Um, the report is uh, prepared by European uh, Institute of Public Administration in consortium with the uh, School of Transnational Governance at EUI in Florence and with uh, support of researchers from Center for European Policy Studies. So we've been awarded this contract. So my remarks are largely based on research among the member states' foreign ministries regarding their approaches to practices and trends in diplomatic training. Uh, at the same time, uh, we ran a survey among the new members in the External Action Service and conducted interviews with senior management uh, in the House in the context of the training needs analysis with a view to extracting the added value that the European Diplomatic Academy could bring. Uh, I should mention, in light of the last uh, comments by James Moran, that we are also conducting the legal and financial analysis, including the governance implications for the future. EU Diplomatic Academy. Um, so I will start by a few observations on the national trainings, a few um, characteristics, distinctive characteristics that um, speak in favor of the arguments of the European level, echoing many of the comments that have been made or arguments that have been made by previous speakers, and then conclude based on our research with a few words on mission objectives and, uh, and the target audience. Uh, now, let me start by saying that not all member states have diplomatic academies. Uh, they have all very different approaches to initial training uh, and to onboarding. Uh, there have been many changes in several member states lately with regard to their approaches to training uh, or only just to length of training. Uh, what is very visible is that there is very, very little EU-specific training, and in particular, European foreign policy training at the national level. Um, in addition to, let's say, foreign ministry-related training, there are other training providers in Europe. It's actually quite a rich landscape, but there is no comprehensive EU or European level uh, training for EU diplomats so far, or for training of European diplomatic uh, corps. Um, I should say that, of course, having a diplomatic academy is not a condition sine qua non for having a good operational, uh, effective foreign policy. Um, but it is in the case of the EU and due to the specificities of the uh, EU level diplomacy, a very good, um, it's a, there's a very good argument to make it. Um, as I said, I will echo some of the things that have been mentioned, but the first thing that comes out of our research is that the EU lab policy making level is so complex, so multi level and multi stakeholder that it takes, just like Fernando just said, quite some time to grasp it. It's about two years, I'm being told, for newcomers to Brussels to really get their way around. Uh, the policy making. Um, now, I don't need to explain to you as the audience why this is so, but let's just say that, of course, training, as Federica just explained, also can speed up these processes and with that also speed up the EU foreign policy making. The second thing is a very different toolbox and of the European foreign policy level uh, and the EU level as such, the combination of common foreign security policy and other external action policies, of course, brings this distinctive nature at EU level policy. Now, we do have staff in the EAS that combines this different knowledge about these different toolboxes, but of course, they need to come together and work together. And again, the training on that can, uh, of course, help also the use the variety of the toolbox at their disposal. Third, institutionally diverse cultures. Uh, even more than 10 years old, the research shows that the divide between different administrative diplomatic cultures is still omnipresent and that there's still quite something that can be done to forge that distinctive EAS uh, administrative culture and with that esprit de corps. Then fourth, the rotation of staff. About a third of staff comes from the member state services for four, eight, or 10 years. And then they leave with a vast majority, with the vast knowledge they acquire. Of course, they enrich national and European level foreign policy with that. But new staff that comes needs the facilitation of picking up faster. And this is where training comes in. And finally, I don't 
something that doesn't come in the first front, that the staff of the external, European External Action Service is more experienced, maybe slightly older in, on average than national um, diplomacies, brings in an immense variety of perspectives. But also this has two implications. Namely, there needs to be a platform to establish the sharing, establish a platform to share the increased capacity. But then, of course, the world is rapidly changing and systematic training fit for today's world helps fit for today's challenges is absolutely necessary with this demography of stuff as well. Now, to conclude, where does this point to the mission objectives and target audience for the EU Diplomatic Academy mission? It's on the basis of research, um, not just from this study, but the research conducted by academics also before us, of course. Um, the future EDA would, of course, have a mission to provide training and education in the field of common foreign security policy, but broadly also in the other areas of external action at European level in order to develop and promote through its training and education activities a common understanding among diplomatic personnel, but also among the civilian and military personnel involved. I want to add this. So, in short, the esprit de corps of the European diplomats. The core objectives come out of that, um, primarily to further enhance the common European identity and the diplomatic culture, esprit de corps, to provide the EAS with necessary knowledge, to provide the member states, administrations and staff with knowledgeable personnel about the EU level, including, of course, the content, the policies, not just the processes. And then, of course, to provide the training and education for the other institutional, uh, for the uh, officials in the other EU institutions and uh, bodies. Uh, this brings me to the last point, possible target audiences. It has already been addressed, uh, but to create this network of European diplomatic corps, uh, well, the first audience are the member states diplomats, whether they might ever join the EAS, whether they might continue in their own service back in the headquarters at any anywhere in their networks, be it in the permanent representations in Brussels or even in New York to know how to cooperate there uh, together and of course together with the EU delegation. Second, the newly recruited personnel at EAS. Um, and thirdly, then the European diplomats at large, at national and EU level, who then seek to deepen, deepen the knowledge on particular aspects of EU foreign policy. Fernanda started with that. It is, the idea is to start, I think, really with the young ones, but um, some of our, let's say, these distinctive elements suggest that uh, training uh, for life of European diplomats uh, should not be, let's say, should be kept within the broader goal of the, of the European Diplomatic Academy. Thank you. Thank you, Sabina. Um, uh, before offering you the opportunity to address our guests, I would like to to do a, a short comment in, in a thing that has been uh, evoked in some of, of the uh, speeches and your questions. Probably there are many uh, young people here. Uh, probably some of you are thinking about approaching this idea, thinking it could be eventually a professional uh, career to start. And then I would like to, to say to you how this has been functioned from the political point of view. The core idea that the pilot project put on the table, it was to create a full-fledged diplomatic academy, not hiding uh, uh, national diplomats, but starting a career like in the countries in which there are uh, diplomatic academies. This is the core political idea, uh, the raw political idea that we put uh, as a group uh, in, the, in the agenda of the parliament, and then we, we had some funding. But I fully understand that it can be simply executed, implement that way, because if you start forming diplomats, how much time it takes in Italian diplomacy to, 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 uh, to reach the level of ambassador in practice? Five years. Right. 20. 20 years. That means even if we start, we are not having EU, EU ambassadors uh, in 20 years. And for that reason, we can't let uh, escape the momentum, the political momentum of starting doing things. And for that reason, even if uh, the, 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 primary, the prime political idea was 
different. We are very happy as a, as a group and as a parliament supporting this uh, experience to create uh, the diplomatic academy in this practical format, not to not to uh, to let the momentum pass because sometimes in politics things change dramatically in a few months. And, and, and this is the idea. If we can, at the end, eventually to have a full-fledged diplomatic academy forming our diplomats uh, uh, among uh, university degrees, like in any other uh, country. But for the moment, it is impossible to start without having a, a layer of national diplomats being specialised in EU uh, policies and and ways of acting. Uh, I, we, as a politician, because we are stubborn, as you know, the diplomats, we are not abandoning this idea. This could be the final goal to reach, but the momentum has to be used to create this immediately, having the support of Borrell, having the support of Sanino, and having uh, Fernando uh, at the wheel. Uh, and for that reason, please don't think, OK, um, I made a mistake. This is not for me. Probably this is for you. And you have to be uh, aware of what is happening. Uh, and of course, you can think you can reach this, uh, um, this uh, uh, target being officials of any institution uh, of the European Union, including the parliament, or uh, being a diplomat on your, on your national diplomacies. But I think that at the end, in some years, we are having a full-fledged uh, diplomatic academy. Uh, this is a, a question that I would like to, ex to explain to you uh, uh, before you can think, OK, then I have to start being a national diplomat or an official of the parliament. This is the other way. And, and then it's your turn to, to make a question to uh, the three, uh, the three uh, guests. Please. Yes, please. Thank you. Thank you for the presentation. My name is Yanis Urbanovic. I come, I, I'm part of PS International Unit. And I would like to ask a question on behalf of skeptics. Is that if we agree with the notion that diplomacy is merely a continuation of national policy, then a diplomat is merely a country's tool or a channel that conducts diplomacy. If he fails to represent national interests, he'll be simply set aside. So on behalf of question, on skeptics, my question is this. Uh, how do we counter this notion that instead of training diplomats, we should instead focus on aligning the government's, national government's policy with EU policy? Thank you. Yeah, uh, I, I get what you're saying. I, th I think the important thing is to remember that there is such a thing as a European interest. Wherever you have a common position in the CFSP, wherever you have um, positions taken by the Commission and others, sometimes the Parliament is involved here as well, um, then you have uh, a European position. One or two member states might not agree, but nevertheless, there is a position, and therefore, there is a European interest to defend and to pursue. Now, this should logically complement most of, if not all, of the national interests. Sometimes they don't, for various reasons. But it is important to distinguish the two. And that, in fact, is, the, I think, the greatest challenge when it comes to uh, uh, people who have been trained and formed in their national services to understand that there is something more than a purely national interest. It's a bigger, not necessarily more important, but it's certainly a wider uh, interest than uh, you would normally be uh, used to. But that is um, a long bridge to cross given the type of uh, training and background many member state diplomats have. Not all, but many of them. So the EDA has a as, as quite a challenge there. No, um, it's, it's a very it's a very good point actually. The one you made. I just want to 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 add a, a practical perspective uh, to what James said. 
uh, one thing I tell to the participants in Bruges always is that, uh, of course, I understand what national interest is, but you need to learn here a different skill. And the different skill is to combine all this national interest and try to build a common denominator out of them, which is the fascinating job of the European diplomat compared with the equally fascinating job of, let's say, a, a, a purely bilateral diplomat. Uh, building a common denominator is fantastic. And I will leave aside the, the, the political aspects of this to focus on the intellectual aspect of it. It's, it's beautiful because it requires an enormous amount of knowledge to start thinking to be useful in building a, a common denominator. First of all, you need to know the national interest of 26 colleagues. And then you can hope to to, to, to find the right uh, chemistry and make the, 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 the synthesis of all that. So this is the core of the job of a European diplomat. Ultimately, it's really a, a question of, of skills. Uh, you need to learn something different when you want to be a European diplomat, which is far more complex and far more beautiful. If you allow me adding to your uh, rationale, uh, the diplomats are the people who had to implement political decisions that has been taken in the council. That means the problem you evoke, it could exist in the ambit of the decision. But once a decision has been taken, we need uh, infantry, we need specialists, we need to be to represent this political decision elsewhere. Then I don't see, uh, I don't see the, the contradiction. The problem is to, to encounter this common denominator. And this is the role of the, of the high representative. That once has been decided, uh, the diplomacy is only, the role of the diplomacy is to implement and to defend this position in, in, the, in, the, in the places they are, they are uh, acting. Uh, Ambassador, you... Sorry, I'm sorry to take the floor again, but since you've mentioned common denominator, I think also part of the, of the challenge, and I agree entirely with you, it, this, is, this is where the skill comes in, is to avoid the lowest yeah. common denominator. Uh, I, have a lot of, uh, I have a lot of experience of trying to do that, uh, and I won't bore you with all of those experiences now, but that's very often the problem. Not so much that you have a position in principle, but more how can you really add value to it by yeah. using your skills to bring people together around more meaningful uh, approaches than you would otherwise have. But the Parliament is going to solve the issue because we are struggling a lot against uh, unanimity <laughs> in, some, in some foreign affairs decision. Sabine, uh, Sabina, do you want to, to jump on this question of the balance between national and European interests? I, I would perfect, I, I agree with what's been said, but maybe just to echo that the Diplomatic Academy is precisely tuned to what Fernando said, this specific uh, their needs uh, that a European level diplomat has. And our research has shown um, that um, even after several years, the national diplomats who joined the EAS on one hand, uh, but also the commission and from the legacy of how EAS has been put together, the commission staff are still discovering the tools they have at their disposal and, and the ways of doing things from a perspective that you're not a member state that you're perceived differently, that you have to approach also other actors in the international community differently, that you have different things to offer. Uh, so such diplomatic academies are absolutely there to make the implementation of the chosen policy um, more efficient and effective. And with that, of course, also to give a more visible and coherent uh, European foreign policy. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Marianne Konings. I am a, a former EU official and I have been the last years of uh, uh, my career. I was EU ambassador to Mexico, EU ambassador to Canada. And my very last, and I would say the best career I had, was I have been the very first EU ambassador for the Arctic. 
Um, my experience uh, during these last 10 years in these functions is that I really welcome uh, this diplomatic uh, academy. When I started my career many, many years ago at, at the EU, uh, I had an Italian head of delegation who was Luigi Boselli, uh, who at that time already was pleading, and I'm speaking here about more than 30 years ago, for a, a diplomatic academy for, for the European Union. So I, I welcome that very much. I also would like to um, I fully support what Jim Moran um, has said is that uh, sectors like science diplomacy and the new ones are extremely important. And there, based on my experience, I'm, I'm sure Jim will confirm that as an EU diplomat and definitely as an EU ambassador, you have to be an expert in everything. You don't have to be necessarily an expert in the bilateral relations, let's say the relations EU-Canada. You have these days to be an expert in climate, in, in trade, uh, in energy uh, sector, uh, and, and geopolitics and geoeconomics. So you really have to deal with all these sectors. And my last uh, point and a question that I want to ask, and unfortunately uh, I, I came too late for uh, hearing what Mrs. Mogherini uh, was saying. My experience is also that within the EU delegation, uh, you have colleagues from the EAS, but also from other institutions, uh, Parliament, uh, European Commission, and um, they lack also especially the young ones, they lack a training in diplomacy. They have no clue, for example, about diplomatic protocol. They do it learning on the spot. But I don't think that's the task of, let's say, a delegation to do. I know that the EIS has uh, a training before people go there. But I wonder, will be the diplomatic academy also offering this possibility uh, for uh, young uh, diplomats uh, joining delegations? This idea of mixing uh, uh, of EU officials and diplomats has been a good idea, it has been conducive, because the uh, diplomats, they offer, the, let's say, the general skills of uh, diplomatic uh, activity, uh, because sometimes they come from countries with some geographical uh, specialization, uh, because they have uh, generally more experience, but at the same time, there are uh, the problems. It's, uh, and the, the, the most pungent issue is the is a temporal hiding of people. The, the hybrid nature has not been so damaging as the temporary one, because that creates some difficult uh, logic. Uh, it's not the same an, an uh, ambassador newly appointed that the ambassador had, he knows that coming in the coming five months, you have to come back to your capital and to ask for another position and to regain a little bit your professional position. Sometimes to come back is not very appealing uh, for, for the diplomats. And we have to say sometimes our diplomats, at least in the last period of his uh, 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 mission in the European Union, are very close, excessively close to the national agenda. Um, using a diplomat uh, thing to say. But uh, we, we, we agree on that. The, the hybrid character uh, uh, overcoming these difficulties of the EU official not having a diplomatic skill, the same that the uh, national diplomats, they don't know the ecosystem in, in Brussels, has to be solved uh, in a way that this hybrid that has functioned very well. But the real problem is the temporary uh, period that the national diplomats stays in Brussels. For us, and for this study that you have uh, uh, in, your, in your places, uh, the temporary uh, condition is, uh, is, very, uh, is, is the most, the difficulty we have to overcome, really, to, to, to create a, a real uh, uh, European diplomacy. But... Thank you. No, just a, a couple of uh, comments to, to your um, considerations. The first one is on, on, on those uh, global issues, which uh, obviously are more and more relevant. Uh, for a long time, maybe there was uh, an illusion to solve problems just focusing on crisis management on the ground. Now, we, I think, have understood that actually there are 
other instruments even more powerful uh, to address certain specific crisis situation that, the, that managing the crisis itself. Uh, energy, now we see it, uh, but digital, uh, climate change, connectivity, I mean, you, you, you. Are. So, and what I want to say is that in the AS, in the last uh, year, year and a half, there's been quite a, a, a restructuring internally to strengthen the capacity on those global issues. Uh, there is no other place in Europe where the amount of knowledge on this global issue is as high as it is in Brussels. And I'm talking specifically about the European Commission. These young junior diplomats who are currently following uh, Bruges are fascinated <laughs> by the amount of things that they see here with their own eyes. And I think this is, uh, this is uh, a, a, an incredibly important added value. And, and the second quick comment on, 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 on protocol, uh, yes, uh, indeed. Actually, they do quite a lot of protocol issues also in Bruges as we speak, because we all know that this is not just form, but it's substance. And if you want to, to, to really uh, do business, uh, first of all, the others have to feel comfortable and whatever you can do to make them feeling comfortable. So yes, protocol is definitely uh, part of, of that. They know yeah. because they are national uh, diplomats. You were referring more to the official, but I think it's good to, 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 to do that, definitely. Um, Sabina, it's your turn. Thank you. I would just uh, like to thank uh, Ambassador Conning for this comment. Um, this was one of the revelations in the research, the attitude towards protocol training. Um, first, in some cases, it's really no longer considered as the essential element. Uh, like, you know, this is postmodern, we're beyond protocol, but as Fernando Gentilini just said, this is not the right, or let's say the diplomatic, close to diplomatic consideration thinking. But the interesting element is here that the divide is not necessarily just be between those who come from the national diplomatic services and those who come from the, uh, let's say, the commission background, but there are also differences between um, in generations, there's a generational difference in considering protocol uh, that there seems to be slightly lower consideration of the importance or understanding of the importance of protocol. Uh, just wanted to say that. And then there is this added added level of the form and substance that you have when you are in the position of an EU diplomatic agent in, and not a national diplomatic agent. Um, so I'm very happy to hear that uh, there is a lot of diplomatic training, uh, protocol training in, in the pilot, but also in the EAS. Um, uh, for example, I'm involved in the um, newcomers training. Uh, we pay a lot of attention to, uh, to protocol in the service of the EAS. Thank you, Sabina. It's your turn, sir. Hello, can you hear me? Um, I understand that not all member states have sent students or participants to the Diplomatic Academy. So my question is, what are you going to do to ensure that the Diplomatic Academy has participants from all EU member states in the future? I understand that some countries have only sent one participant and even big member states like Spain didn't send anybody. Yes, no, it's a, it's a, it's a good point. Uh, uh, what happened this year was that we really did this in a rush, uh, as uh, Nacho was saying. You know, we wanted to, to, to take the momentum, to use the momentum and move from a, a simple study into something already concrete. Uh, a, already a, a first a pilot project, uh, which means that uh, some might have had not uh, the time to, 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 to consider, to make the choices. You know that uh, national foreign ministries uh, have a quite uh, a complicated planning cycle. Uh, uh, you need to decide well in advance uh, the, the, the positions, the future of something. But so, to be short, I am very confident that next year uh, we will have 
uh, participants from uh, all member states. At least this is what I what I hope, uh, and I have reason to 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 hope that. So it was not, let's say, a lack of interest. Uh, on the contrary, I think it was that we really did this. Uh, the, the crunch thing point was in, in, in three, four months uh, last uh, spring. Uh, we informed, we did, we, we, we used the, the amount made available by the European Bank and, 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 and we did it. So it's true that there are a few countries uh, and also some institutions here who were not in the position to, to make a choice or also to, to find the right people to send. And uh, that's also was actually part of the problem. So it's not that they don't want to be part of this. It's that I think uh, we need more time to, and I think next year I'm very hopeful. I'm, I'm sure, I'm pretty sure every country is sending people having the time and knowing what happened, that we are in a rush, it's, it's the case of the parliament. The parliament uh, chose some officials, but the officials have a lot of duties uh, in the house, and it was impossible simply to disappear for, for nine months. And then knowing how the, the practice of the pilot project is functioning, I'm sure every institution and every ministry is going to send uh, the profiles uh, uh, useful for this uh, for this experience in the next uh, round. Uh, there was other person? Yes, madam. Thank you so much for the presentation. My question is regarding the young diplomats from candidate states. Where do you see their role in the future? Uh, you mean participants from candidate states? Yes. Yeah. No, no, we wanted to open up because it's, it's in a way, it's, it's natural. Eh? Uh, our future is going to be the same. Uh, both whether you are a diplomat uh, representing currently a member state or whether you come from a country which one day hopefully will become a member state. So the, the notion of uh, opening this up to, to candidate country, in my view, uh, is, is very, very clear. And I think that was the, the right uh, decision. Um, as uh, also Federica was hinting to, this somehow also complicates life uh, for for organizing a training because the training has to be different in many ways because if you come from a member state or if you come from a candidate country there is a difference in what you know already what you need to know and also on on, on the mechanic on how you uh, do uh, the training access to document just to make an example no might be um, obviously different so uh, all, clearly, we are looking into this and, and, and trying to, to, to take the best decision for the future in order this synergy to continue. Yeah. Thank you. I don't know, Sabina, if you touch this issue of the, of the participants coming from a candidate uh, states in, in the study? Uh, no, in fact, uh, uh, we did not, it was not within the mandate of the study, but if I can add to the member state sending, um, maybe on a positive or optimistic side, um, we did not, or let's say there ha there is no member state, at least as expressed in our research, that would um, not be positive to the idea of having a very structured uh, European diplomatic training as a permanent European diplomatic training. There are different views with regard to conditions of participation, with regard to duration, and I'm sure there are others that have not yet been shared with regard to uh, how this is supposed to be working in general, but uh, the, I, the, the, the understanding of a need for this, I think it's quite uh, present in, in all member states and the reasons uh, I can just, I mean, I would agree uh, with what's been said, the reasons for some not having sent uh, pertain uh, in a large extent to the rather short period to, for the possibility to choose. Thank yeah. you, Sabina. Ambassador. Just one point to add on this um, um, business of the member states uh, sending their people to the academy. I think it will be very important how practical it is, I don't know. But it would be very important, especially for ambassadors coming from member states without any background in the institution, and, and, and that, of course, is many of them, that it's mandatory 
that there is in, uh, an insistence that they will spend six weeks, three months, whatever, uh, after selection, uh, before taking up their post, to spend those, that time in the um, diplomatic academy. Now, that is easier said than done. Uh, given uh, the attitude, certainly, of some member states, given also here in the institutions, it's very urgent, we have a crisis going on, we need a man or a woman on the spot, etc. But I think insofar as that's possible, I would uh, hope that it would be somehow the default uh, position that they would have to spend maybe up to three months, I don't know, but a period before they go out to take up their post. Yeah, we, we from the Parliament, um, we share the, the, our views with the Stella Survey. We didn't detect any kind of political reluctance to the issue. It could be practical issues. But for the moment, uh, in the Council, there are no express uh, political uh, grievances or nuances or, or preoccupation with, with the idea as it is at the, uh, this very moment. And questions? Any other questions? Uh, if not, uh, I would like to thank our participants and just to talk about the future, yes, has been raised by, by Federica. We have to explore the ways to contract or to hire or to engage a diplomats because uh, the particularities or the intricacies of the procedures of the European Union to hire personnel are different than, than others and there are no specialized uh, tests or proofs or uh, exams for, for particular uh, uh, profiles. And this is a thing that I know that uh, the external survey has to, has to study for the future, how to engage the people we are training, at least to offer for some of them the possibility to, to, to stay as a European diplomat in a way. But this is part, we are just starting, guys. We, we only have some months of work, and this is going to be uh, developed and implementing in the future. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Ambassadors. Uh, thank you, Sabina. And thank you to Federica. Thank you all. And you can follow uh, the outcomes of the, of the process, because, as Sabina said, we are having a, a study on the feasibility of the, of the European Academic in, in a month, more or less, and we are having, I hope, good news. Thank you all for, for attending the, the gathering and thank you for, for participating. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sabina. Muchas gracias. We, we have coffee. Gracias. We have coffee and, and some, some uh, pastries. Uh, if you want to, to share a coffee and to comment. Uh, gladly we we stay with you well thank you